Hi, UCFDPT first years. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed I am not Dr. Sani, um, but I am going to be taking over and hijacking your anatomy lecture for the day. Uh, my name is Kelly Lamaster. I am a recent UCFDPT alum graduate, uh, 2020, and I am going to be talking to you guys today about the perineum and the creative organs. Hooray! Um, so just as a kind of a side note, um, we're going to be going over the structure and function on the basic binary sex characteristics for male and female. Um, but you guys know there's a ton of variations in configuration and appearance that you guys could run into either um, in your lab dissections or more likely out in your clinical practice. Um, so we don't really have time to dive into all of those variations and things that could be um, intersex, transgender, all of that kind of thing. And that can be a whole specialty practice in and of itself. Um, so what this is meant to be is sort of a foundational knowledge base on the binary genitals so that you will be able to orient yourself on your landmarks and appropriately assess whatever patient is sitting in front of you, no matter what their individual appearance is. Um, and if you're interested in pursuing pelvic health PT um, and you would like some more information on kind of how to approach um, inclusive care and that kind of thing, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I've got a whole big list of really great resources. And also don't forget about Dr. Rothschild because she is a fabulous resource that you all have as well. So with that, let's dive in. So this first slide is just sort of going over um, our anatomical landmarks and the borders of the perineum. Um, so, we go from the pubic symphysis on the anterior to the two ischial tuberosities and then back to the coccyx. So those are all bony landmarks that you can palpate to easily find your way around the borders of the perineum. And then we divide that space down the middle with an imaginary line between the two ischial tuberosities. And we divide that into the urogenital triangle in the anterior and the anal triangle in the posterior. And since this can be a little bit of a weird space to sort of wrap your head around um, exactly what we're talking about, um, I've got a little 3D video for you guys to watch to sort of help get you in the right frame of mind for the rest of what's to come. The pelvis is a complex piece of anatomy, so let's begin by taking a moment to get our bearings. The perineum lies at the bottom of the pelvis. It is the space between the thighs encompassing anus and genitals. It is a diamond shaped space. The corners of the diamond are the coccyx, pubic symphysis and two ischial tuberosities. The ceiling of the space is the pelvic floor muscles. The pelvic floor muscles, or levator ani, are shaped like a bowl. So the ceiling of the space is partly convex. The walls are the ischiopubic rami, the sacrotuberous ligament, which are the boundaries of the pelvic outlet. The diamond's anterior half is known as the urogenital triangle. The posterior half, the anal triangle. In a standing position, the urogenital triangle roughly conforms to the horizontal plane. The anal triangle is on an upward tilt, around 30 degrees from horizontal. To bring some perspective, here's the femur, a rough approximation of the coronal plane. Returning now to an inferior view. The urogenital triangle contains a fibrous sheet called the perineal membrane, oriented like so.
The perineal membrane has upturned anterior and posterior edges and collects within it a space known as the deep perineal pouch. The ischioanal fossae partially occupy the space between this pouch and the pelvic floor muscles. The deep perineal pouch is thus a very shallow space. All of this in blue, ischioanal fossae, and the space contained by and just deep to the perineal membrane, coloured in purple, that's the deep perineal pouch. It contains within it a number of muscles, including the external urethral sphincter. In the female sex, the pouch includes two holes for vagina and urethra. These are allowed passage through the levator ani muscles in this U-shaped space known as the urogenital hiatus. Just deep to the skin is a membranous layer of superficial fascia known as Colley's fascia. And between the perineal membrane and the relevant part of Colley's fascia lies the superficial perineal pouch. This pouch contains the bulbospongiosis, ischiocavenosis, and superficial transverse perineal muscles. It also contains various erectile tissue of the penis and clitoris, plus the continuation of the urethra and vagina. So that's the superficial and deep perineal pouches. The perineal membrane has a free posterior border. In the centre of this posterior border and of the diamond-shaped perineum at large lies the perineal body, fibromuscular meeting point for many structures of the perineum. Many of the muscles we've mentioned so far converge here. Posterior and superior to that is the anal sphincter muscles, the centrepiece of the anal triangle. Let's go back and review the most important points now. The perineum is a 3D space with the pelvic floor muscles as its ceiling. The space is divided into the urogenital triangle anteriorly and anal triangle posteriorly. There are two perineal pouches, superficial and deep, both in the urogenital triangle and separated by the perineal membrane. That's it for now. Hit subscribe if you liked this video. Thanks for watching and we will see you next time. Okay. So hopefully that kind of gave you guys a little bit better 3D image on what exactly we were going to be diving into and talking about. Um, and with that, we're gonna start in the anal triangle. So just reminder that goes from that imaginary line between the two ischial tuberosities back to the coccyx and includes that anal canal uh, bordered by that pubo rectalis as it swoops around. You guys remember from your pelvic floor lecture. Um, on the lateral borders, we have our obturator internus covered by the obturator fascia. That's this guy right here. Uh, and then the medial wall is the levator ani as it comes down. So that's that whole um, structure that you're just looking at right there. Um, so between the obturator internus and the ischial tuberosities, you're going to find the pudendal canal that contains that internal pudendal artery and vein and the pudendal nerve. Um, and here is a little bit better image of that from complete anatomy. Um, so to orient, we've got our sacrum and our coccyx right here, <clears throat> excuse me, and highlighted in green here is the pudendal canal, and um, that's al also called Alcox canal, so if you're ever um, in a pelvic health space or anything and you hear someone uh, referring to Alcox canal, just know that's that pudendal nerve um, is what they're talking about. Um, so this muscle right here coming from the inside of the pelvis and swooping out laterally, that is our obturator internus right here. 
These are our pelvic floor muscles right here, our um, ischiocavernosus, or, sorry, iliococcygeus, coccygeus, and puborectalis right there, sorry. Um, and then this is our piriformis swooping across right here. So you can see how that pudendal nerve comes out from those nerve roots, swoops out between that pelvic floor and the piriformis, and then comes down through that pudendal canal to then swoop anteriorly to supply all of those external genitalia. So that ischioanal fossa that was just mentioned in the video, um, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more depth. Um, so the lateral wall of that is the obturator internus, which is covered by the fascia, and then the medial wall is the levator ani. So it, it kind of forms like a, like a wedge or a tent shape, um, where this side is going to be the levator ani, and this side is the obturator internus, and we're talking about that space in there. So kind of looking at these diagrams and orienting yourself. So here we have that levator ani swooping down, and then you can kind of see through on the other side this this close side's obturator is cut away, um, but on that far side, you can see how it's sort of shadowed behind there. So it would be the space in between those two where you can see those arrows are kind of pointing in. It's that space that we're talking about here. Um, and the medial boundary also is sort of um, where the levator ani um, communicates with the urogenital diaphragm um, and where that perineal body sits. So again, on the bottom here, um, so that would be our um, perineal membrane superficially there. You can see our obturator internus, you can see our levator ani, and we're talking about that space where those arrows are slipping in there. That's where we're talking about. So getting, a, again, a little bit more of a 3D view to kind of help solidify what we're talking about here. We got a short video. In order to appreciate better the space that is the ischioanal fossa, let's first get our bearings. So here we have the pelvis, which I'm going to make a sagittal cut through. This reveals the three organs of the female pelvis, bladder, the uterus, and the rectum, which becomes the anal canal. Directly lateral to these organs are the muscles of the pelvic floor, which support the pelvic organs like a hammock. The ischioanal fossae are directly lateral to levator ani here. It contains mostly fat and thus acts as a kind of cushion surrounding the hammock. In this model, we've scraped out all of the fat, which usually fills the space. And so this opening you can see here is the ischioanal fossa. And it's one of those areas of anatomy that is quintessentially hard to grasp in two dimensions. But in 3D, it becomes much easier. The space is shaped like a wedge. Like this. I'll bring back in the pubic bone for orientation. So I hope that geometry makes sense to you. Let's bring in the lateral wall now, which is the obturator internus muscle, as well as part of the ischium, which is this part of the pubic bone. Let's bring in the medial wall now, which is, of course, levator ani. So now we see that the space exists between the bowl-shaped pelvic floor and the, the bones of the pelvis, essentially. And as I mentioned, it is filled with fat. The cushioning provided by that adipose tissue allows the anal canal to expand during defecation. So as always in anatomy, the form reflects function. So let's round out the boundaries now. As I mentioned, the lateral wall is obturator internus and part of the pubic bone the medial wall, the pelvic floor muscles. The floor is the deep perineal fascia. And the posterior wall is the sacrotuberous ligament, as well as gluteus maximus. This view 
might look more familiar to you. This is what we tend to get shown in med school and if you search ischioanal fossa on Google, this is likely what will come up. It's my hope that after this video the dimensions of the ischioanal fossae make a little bit more sense to you now. Now if you'd like to navigate around this model yourself, hit the link in the video description below. Thanks for watching, hit subscribe and we will see you next time. Okay, so hopefully that helped. Um, so now we're just kind of moving on. So that last coronal section that he showed you in the video, that's what we're looking at now. Uh, so again, you can see the superficial fascial membrane. Um, and then we can see the obturator internus here on the lateral wall, our levator ani here on the medial side, our fat or fascia or connective tissue um, in the issue anal fossa itself right here. Um, and then right here we have, just like we showed, we have that pudendal canal running right here um, with that pudendal artery vein and nerve right there. Um, and in the anterior recess of that ischioanal fossa, um, that superficial fascia, um, it has folds that sort of curve around and fold in on themselves so that that anterior portion, that anterior recess of that fossa is within the urogenital triangle. Um, and the anterior half of that opening is in the, the front. So in the three-dimensional sense, it kind of, it goes through both the anal and the urogenital triangle spaces um, deep to those running that way. So here, as we're showing, that's that anterior recess of that ischioanal fossa where that goes into that urogenital triangle underneath that urogenital diaphragm with those little arrows just like we showed before. So here on the bottom is just a little bit different sort of more abstract diagram where you can see that wedge shape of the um, issue anal fossa and those arrows, those arrows going in there. So you've got that urogenital diaphragm, the perineal membrane, and um, your um, deep perineal space in there. So moving forward to the urogenital triangle, um, that is the anterior region, imaginary line between the two ischial tuberosities along the pubic rami up to the pubic symphysis. And so within that space, um, bordered posteriorly by that imaginary line, um, and that is where the perineal membrane uh, sits and sort of ends right there. Um, and at the back of that, where that X is right here, that's where you have that perineal body where some of those muscular and fascial attachments sit, um, sort of in the middle between the urogenital and anal triangles right on that midline. Um, and so, in that urogenital diaphragm area, that's where we have that superior fascia, the inferior fascia, um, here in the purple and the green, and then in the middle sandwiched in there is our deep transverse perineum, where you have your deep transverse perineal muscle, um, as well as um, the erectile tissue for the male and female. Um, and then we have all of our fascial layers in there. Um, so we'll get into the scarpas versus startos versus collies. Um, but as we showed in the video, sort of what comes from the posterior side and swoops underneath there on that superficial layer is going to be the collies fascia. So here's another view. Um, this is that perineal membrane on the left here highlighted. And then on the right, it's dissected away so you can see that deep transverse perineal muscle. Um, and then along the midline, we have the uh, urogenital hiatus where the urethra, um, sphincter urethrae is allowed to come through. Um, and that is composed of um, smooth skeletal muscle and that is under voluntary control. So you have to be able to voluntarily relax that in order to 
allow for uh, elimination of urine. So that colloids fascia in the posterior extent, um, sorry, the superficial fascia that is inferior to the urogenital diaphragm, um, which is kind of what we're looking at here, um, is like I said, it's the posterior extension of colloids fascia. And that is what that perineal membrane right here is. Um, so all of that, that uh, sphincter urethrae uh, is innervated by the perineal branch of that pudendal nerve that we mentioned um, along with all of the external genitalia. So here in that superficial perineal pouch we have a lot of fascial layers. Uh, so we have that deep fascial layer that sort of runs around the whole of everything and sort of folds in on itself and then sort of runs along the levator ani. Um, and scarpa's fascia here, the superficial fascia, when we're talking about that, that blue line, um, here on the front, scarpa's is part of superficial fascia of the abdomen. So that extends over the abdominal wall. And then as it descends from the abdomen down into the perineal space and the genitalia, it becomes darto's fascia along the external genitalia for both the male and the female. Um, so in the male, it will go over the external uh, surface of the penis, and then on the female, it will be on the labia majora. It will be darto's fascia underlying those structures. Um, and then on the males, it also goes around the testes as well. And then as we get posterior there on that perineal membrane, that's where we get to collies fascia. So you see the collies sort of runs here on the posterior inferior side, and then here where it joins up and folds back in on itself, it becomes that perineal membrane for that inferior fascia. And then that also, as that does that, that forms that anterior recess of that ischioanal fossa right there. There we go right in there. So here's just outlined in blue. This is a cor coronal section of kind of what we were just looking at. So that's those fascia layers that curve around um, from the posterior and form that anterior recess of that ischioanal fossa. Um, so we have the levator ani floor right here. We have our obturator internus on the outside again. Um, and we have our deep transverse perineal muscle running across the bottom here. So the perineum begins inferior to the urogenital diaphragm again, which is down here. And so in that space, you find all of the erectile tissue. So here we have the cruce of the clitoris and the ischiocavernosus muscle that runs here. And we have the vestibular bulb and the bulbospongiosus muscle right here and then our superficial membranous fascia. Um, and then that's also obviously here in the external area where you would find um, the vestibule of the vagina, with where, which is the opening of the labia minora, um, and then the testes or the scrotum for the male. So contents of that perineal space. Speaking more specifically about testes and scrotum, um, so the scrotum is the epidermal pouch that houses the testes. Um, and so there's layers of muscle and fascia within that structure. Um, and during development, those all descend from the posterior abdominal wall. And so they carry all of those layers just sort of down with them as they descend from the abdominal wall down into what becomes the testes. So you can kind of see here up at the top where we have our transversus abdominis, our internal oblique and our external oblique muscle and all of those sort of come down, descend, and all of those structures get pulled down into the testes. So all of those layers have to come down with it. Um, so the layer so let's get ourselves highlighted here. So this layer coming from the peritoneum, that's highlighted in green, 
that becomes the tunica vaginalis. And the tunica vaginalis is derived from the vaginal process of the peritoneum. Um, so that precedes in the fetus the descent of the testes from the abdomen down into the scrotum. So in the skin, of, we have the skin of the scrotum with the dartos fascia and then the cremaster muscle, which comes from the external oblique muscle right up here. So we can see that kind of all descends. Um, and that comes from the inguinal canal and it comes from the internal oblique muscle. Um, and that serves to um, elevate the testes uh, in order to regulate the temperature of uh, the testes and make sure that they're at the correct temperature for spermatozoa pr production. Um, and so the, the actual the wrinkling that you see in the surface of the scrotum is where those muscle fibers are actually invested into the skin um, so that it can pull that structure up or when they relax, allow it to drop down away from the body for cooling. Um, so those muscles, um, you would not be able to see them in your dissection. They're very, very, very fine, very small fibers. Um, and again, as that, that fascia comes down into that testicle, um, it's going to change names and it's going to be Darto's fascia. So that cremaster muscle, as it descends down into that testy structure, it's also going to be called Darto's muscle. So it's the same muscle. It's still that cremaster muscle. It just changes names and becomes Darto's there. So it's a little confusing, but um, just know that you've got that Darto's is that area over the genitalia itself specifically. So yeah, now we've got that blue line, pink line. Okay, so when we transect the testicle and look inside to see all of the structures that we have there, um, starting, we have the tunica vaginalis, which is, again, as we said, an extension of the peritoneal fascia that goes down into the scrotum and the testes, um, and it's invested along the surface of the testes. Um, and just like any um, parietal layer there is, um, or like peritoneum, sorry, um, there's a parietal layer and there's a visceral layer. Um, so we have this parietal layer around the outside, and the visceral layer is what is attached to the actual organ itself. Um, the parietal layer is not attached to the organ, but the visceral layer is. So um, as you can imagine, if you have a trauma to the area or something, that would create a space in here where, tr where fluid could potentially build up. So highlighted in yellow here, we have our seminiferous tubules. Um, and that is where the production of spermatocytes happens. Um, they are formed from the epithelial lining of those seminiferous tubules. Um, and they are, these tubules are separated in the testes by the tunica albuginea, which is highlighted here in tan. And that sort of separates it off into these lobules that you see. So then as those spermatocytes are created, uh, those, they are transferred via the straight tubules or the tubuli recti um, up into the mediastinum testes, which is this green area that we've just highlighted here. And the opening of that, so there's the tubuli recti, so that is what transfers those spermatocytes from the seminiferous tubules up into the mediastinum testis. And then the opening to the mediastinum testis, all those little circles that you see drawn in there, that is the reet testes. Um, and that opens posteriorly into efferent ductules um, that release the spermatocytes into the epididymis, which, there you go, efferent ductules right there, going posteriorly into the epididymis, which is this whole pink thing right here. Uh, the head is wraps like around the posterior of the testes. So we've got the head and then inferiorly we have the tail along the posterior surface. 
and then our ductus deferens runs from the tail along and it ascends kind of along the epididymis to reach the ejaculatory ducts. So we have the penis next, um, and it is composed of spongy erectile tissue. Um, centrally, we have, um, there's more posteriorly in the central region, there's the erectile tissue, and it has three portions in a male. Um, so we have the corpus cavernosum, which is this section right here. There's two parts of it, and it's joined along the middle right here, and then the corpus spongiosum right here in the middle. And the corpus cavernosum um, becomes the bulb of the penis at the base, and that is covered by um, the muscular fibers of the bulbospongiosus muscle, which you can see right here, and then we have the ischiocavernosus muscle wrapping around it from the sides here. Um, so those two paired structures um, of the corpus cavernosum are fused by the membrane along the midline, and then um, it splits into the crura of the penis, as you can see right here. So that, that bulb in the middle from the corpus spongiosum, and then the corpus cavernosum, we have the crura as it splits along each side. So you have those three parts. One two for our crus or crura and the bulb leading up into the corpus spongiosum. Oop, apologize. Not done there. So the, um, the ischio cavernosus muscle here, um, that wraps around the posterior side, um, but the, the muscle fibers don't completely cover on the anterior side. Um, erectile function in um, normal male anatomy is uh, facilitated by blood flow. So you get increased blood flow, which causes increased pressure, which causes your erection. Um, and then distally on the corpus spongiosum, uh, on that structure, we have it expands and forms the glands of the penis, which is the head of the penis. And that's just an enlargement of that corpus spongiosum. All of that is supplied by the internal pudendal artery um, and then the afferent and efferent fibers of the pudendal nerve. So here we just have a cross section through the penis showing all of these structures. Um, this is a coronal section through the shaft. Um, and so this, again, you can see all of those multiple layers of fascia that are in there. So superficially, again, in yellow, we have that dartos fascia. And then the deeper layers here um, on the penis is called buck's fascia. And then um, you can see that tunica albuginea that we had in the testes also extends around the corpus cavernosum on either side here. and around the corpus spongiosum in the inferior portion of the image here. And then the spongy tissue, again, um, within the corpus cavernosa, as we said, we're, those are supplied by the deep artery of the penis, which you can see right here on this cross section. And there are superficial paired veins up here so the deep and superficial penile veins for draining. Um, and the deep one is, is just deep to that deep buck's fascia there along the midline. Um, so again, you know, controlled by blood flow and as the sympathetic tone changes and the parasympathetic tone increases, so then that'll cause your capillaries to open and increase blood flow, um, and etc. So remember the, um, the actual erection mechanism is controlled by the parasympathetics and the ejaculation is controlled by sympathetics. And then down here in the, um, 
in the corpus spongiosum, we also find the, uh, the penile section of the urethra. So moving to the female external genitalia. So all of the external female genitalia is also called the vulva. So your vulva is not your vagina. Um, it, the vulva is sort of referring to the entirety of the exter external female genitalia. Um, so it's composed of the mons pubis, which is that top uh, anterior section, and then, uh, which is the anterior extension of the labia majora. So your labia majora come down either side here. And then moving centrally, we have our labia minora, which are the much thinner and more delicate portions of epithelium that were there. Um, and those labia minora merge both posteriorly and anteriorly. Um, here they merge into, um, anteriorly, here they merge into a frenulum um, and split over the glands of the clitoris, which is the head of the clitoris right here. And then, and they communicate with the clitoris um, forming that prepuce, which is that hood over the top. So you can see how they kind of join together in that frenulum and then they split again to form that clitoral hood, that prepuce that comes over the top of the glands of the clitoris. Um, so between those two labia minora, we will find um, the opening, which is called the vestibule for the vagina. Um, and you also have your external urethral orifice within that. So on the anterior, uh, portion of that vestibule, you'll have your external urethral or orifice, and then posteriorly you'll have your vaginal orifice. And then just posterior to all of that, where the labia minora and majora join together, we have the region of the perineal body. So that is where that bulbospongiosis, the transverse parent, the superficial transverse perineal muscles, um, all of your fascia layers, all of that joins together right there at that perineal body. And that's sort of a supportive point for all of those muscles and uh, a point to allow um, those muscles to have a line of pull from right there. Um, and obviously the, that can be, that frenulum um, down to the perineal body can be um, torn or cut during childbirth, um, which falls under the purview of um, pelvic health physical therapy to help those women following that trauma. So as we move into um, comparative anatomy, a lot of these structures are pretty much the same. They just um, arrange slightly differently. Both structures have erectile tissue. Um, they're just a little bit differently oriented. In the male, we have our corpus spongiosum with the root being the bulb and the crura. Um, and the crura is part of the corp corpus cavernosum. Um, in the female, that corpus cavernosum um, is becoming the crura posteriorly within um, the deep surface of the labia minora. Um, so you can see we have the glands of the clitoris, which is analogous to the glands of the penis here, coming through the body, which is the same as the body with the corpus cavernosum. So that's that corpus cavernosum, which splits down along either side along the pubic ramus and into the roots, which is the same as the crus or the roots of, uh, of the penis in the male. So the bulbospongiosis sort of runs under the labia on the female and sort of run, wraps around the base of the penis on the male. So those, those names don't change for the muscles. Um, between male and female, you still have your um, issue cavernosis, your bulbospongiosis, your uh, superficial transverse perineum. Those are all the same no matter what you're looking at there. So here we can kind of see the relationship of that perineal body here on the bottom. 
between the two. Um, so where you have that bulbospongiosis and your issue, so your ischiocavernosis kind of runs along those pubic rami and away to the sides. The bulbocavernosis runs either around the bulb of the penis or around the lab, under, beneath the labia majora, and they both attach down there at the perineal body for both sexes. Um, and your anal sphincter also connects through to that perineal body as well. So as we discussed during childbirth, um, that perineal body is at risk for being either um, torn or ruptured. Um, so because you can kind of see how, how that perineal body sits and how all of those muscles wrap and attach so that increased pelvic pressure um, can really result in um, some very big stresses on those, on those structures and on that area. Um, so if they think that it is possible for that tearing to happen during childbirth, they will um, a lot of times perform an episiotomy, um, which is where they will go in and actually cut those structures. And most of the time it will either be posterior or posterior lateral, um, and the reasoning there is they're trying to avoid the um, pudendal artery, nerve vein, all of that. So they're trying to avoid those structures um, to relieve the the pressure on those structures and to um, allow for um, facilitation of the childbirth um, without further damage to any of these structures um, or baby or mom in the process. Um, so clearly, if that happens afterwards, it's got to have it's going to have to be repaired, sutured, um, which means that that is then a wound that needs cared for. Um, and also, once those structures have been interrupted, there's also going to need to be rehab um, involved to make sure that those structures are all functioning um, as they should in order to prevent things like. Um, incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, which are both very, very common following childbirth. Um, and most women are not referred to pelvic PT appropriately um, as they should be. Um, and in really bad cases, um, so there's grading for those tears, one to fourth degree, and fourth degree tears can actually result in um, vaginoanal fistulas, and so those can result in recurrent infections, and it can get really bad. Um, so just Knowing that if you have a patient who is postpartum and who is complaining of pressure in their pelvic floor or um, pain and difficulty with prolonged sitting or um, incontinence, um, anything like that, where you know you you would want to either refer out to a pelvic PT if you're not um, able or comfortable handling that, or assess a little bit more exactly what's going on because they may need some pelvic floor rehab. So looking more into the innervation of the perineal structures and the creative organ, um, the pudendal nerve, as we've been talking about, it comes from the S2, 3, and 4 roots, um, exits the pelvis via the greater sciatic foramen, um, and all of our external genital structures are innervated by branches of that pudendal nerve. Um, so it changes names depending on exactly what the structure is, male versus female, female, so you might have a vaginal branch versus a penile branch, etc. Um, but it is all the pudendal nerve. Um, so as it exits the pelvis in the greater sciatic format, foramen, um, and then it travels externally um, through that pudendal canal like we showed you earlier. Um, over the sacrospinous ligament, and then it goes back into the pelvic space via the lesser sciatic foramen, and then swoops forward within the ischioanal fossa um, to reach the external genitalia. So just like we showed you in that complete anatomy image earlier, um, where it kind of comes out, swoops out, comes through that, that canal along the back, and then swoops forward through that ischioanal fossa to go and reach its destination. Um, and then from that, we also have the branch for the inferior rectal nerve, which innervates your rectum. So here we have the female example um, for the branches of the nerves, uh, the perineal portion of that pudendal nerve. Um, 
as it reaches the perineum. Um, so we have superficial on the left and deep on the right here. On the superficial side, we have the perineal nerve that branches into the labial nerve and the, um, the deep portion of the pudendal nerve then becomes the dorsal nerve of the clitoris. And then in the central area there, we have the inferior rectal nerve and the rectal branches. So here branching off dorsal nerve of the clitoris coming up here to where we would have our glands or head of the clitoris here. Our posterior labial nerves within the perineal membrane from our pudendal nerve branch here coming through that ischioanal fossa. So as you can see from all of this, um, there's a lot of places where that pudendal nerve can run into trouble or get entrapped or um, be subjected to recurrent microtraumas. Um, so recurrent microtraumas would be things like um, repeated bike riding, horseback riding, um, extended sitting, that kind of thing. Um, sorry, you guys sitting in lectures all the time. Um, so, and this can present in a whole lot of different ways. So because that pudendal nerve branches and um, supplies so many of these structures um, within the perineum and the external genitalia and helps to facilitate all of these things like our voluntary control of our external sphincters and things. So you can have uh, a lot of different symptoms and it can show up very differently in a lot of people, but also just make sure that you're screening appropriately and really using your, um, your musculoskeletal knowledge and your skills appropriately because a lot of times um, pudendal neuralgia will get overdiagnosed, um, but it can include things like sexual dysfunction, um, and it can go both ways, including persistent arousal or difficulty with arousal, depending on um, whether it's a hyper or hypo sensitivity of the nerve. Um, and you can get vulvodynia, um, which is uh, pain around the vulva um, and male impotence. And then you can get like, you know, we were talking about the control of both of our external sphincters. So you can get um, sphincter dysfunction. Um, so you can get either um, incontinence where it is not able to hold the tone appropriately and you'll have leakage um, either fecal or urinary or um, you can also have urinary hesitancy where they're not able to relax where they're not able to voluntarily relax that external sphincter so um, a lot of times this will happen more often with males but you'll have um, it can happen in both sexes um, and you will have that hesitancy where they have trouble relaxing to fully let the, the urine eliminate. Um, and you can also have um, altered sensation, weird sensation. Sometimes they'll complain of like a foreign body sensation within the, uh, the anus or the rectum or the vagina. Uh, uh, or, but also distinguishing from that sense of fullness that we talked about earlier that could be a symptom of pelvic organ prolapse. So here we have the male example of the pudendal nerve branching. So the perineal nerve on the male then would become the posterior scrotal nerve. Um, all of those superficial and deep branches are analogous to the female, it's just those different names. So it would be the dorsal penile nerve and sort of instead of the clitoral nerve. Um, and the scrotal nerve as opposed to the labial nerve. Rectal nerve is still the same um, and everything sort of runs along similar pathways there. So our blood supply for the perineum, um, it's analogous male and female. On the left here again we have our superficial branches of the inter internal pudendal artery and then on the right, we have our deep branches, um, and those travel sort of anteriorly to supply um, the bulb of the penis, 
um, and then those become the dorsal artery of the penis or the dorsal artery of the clitoris, depending on which uh, you're looking at. And then the superficial branches will become the perineal arteries um, to supply the, the posterior scrotum or the posterior labia, labia um, respectively. And that, my friends, is about all I have for you guys today on the perineum and creative organs. Um, I hope that wasn't too confusing or crazy. Um, and as I said, um, if you would like any more resources, um, I've got some good resources that will kind of help you uh, identify all of those little swooping interweaved muscles that exist in that small space. Um, and some good resources on um, inclusive care and pelvic health and all of that kind of thing if you're interested in that. Um, so looking forward to hopefully seeing you guys in lab in the fall um, and hope that you guys are surviving in your online classes this summer. So good luck, work hard, and we will see you this fall. Thanks so much, guys.